Hi, welcome to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl and I take you through the uh, winding pathways of our show uh, every week, every month, or however often you watch it. Uh, this is a show that um, concentrates on issues of interest uh, to, by, and about our lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, and allied communities. So uh, welcome to the show. We have a really interesting show today. Uh, it's about, if I were to give it a title, I'd say it's about our transgendered young people. But it's really about a lot more than that, as you'll see from my three guests, because this whole issue of gender, which has been the element of the discussion about lesbian and gay people, about transgender issues, about whether people are dressed correctly or not correctly for their sex at birth, whatever, has really been the thing I think that has come to bind us all together in this movement and has caused many of our allies to think about their own attitudes and their own lives. So I'm very pleased to have three wonderful people with me today. First, Sethisha Iraheta, who is a fundraiser, a um, young person that I met, as you'll hear, at a hearing that we had, very, very bright and wonderful young woman. Welcome. Thank you. And Carolyn Laub, who is the founder and executive director of the Gay Straight Alliance Network here in California. Welcome, Carolyn. Thanks. And Mason Davis, who's the executive director of the Transgender Law Center, a statewide organization, but based in San Francisco. Thanks Welcome, for Mason. Me. Thank you. Mason, let's start with you. Um, people like to know a little bit about the people who are going to be giving them all this information. So uh, tell us a little about your life and br what brought you to this work. Well, like a lot of people who've done um, gay and lesbian advocacy, I think I, in many ways, came out of the womb uh, believing in the need to advocate for the disenfranchised in our own community. Um, I come from a long line of ministers in the Midwest and knew at a pretty young age it was a little different than a lot of the people I was um, around in a pretty small conservative town in Missouri. And, um, you know, as a transgender person, as an adult, um, re remember the many days that I would um, go to elementary school and get halfway to school and change clothes uh, in the bushes on the way to school and then do that on the way back because um, I had a real sense of, uh, an internal sense of gender that was different than what most girls were expected to do or be at that time. Um, I've been active in the LGBT movement for about 20 years now. Um, having come out originally as a lesbian before I realized I was transgender and doing a lot of anti-violence work within the LGBT community in Chicago and then eventually moving out here to California where I helped start a group called FTM Alliance of Los Angeles to do community building work um, because at the time when you went to a transgender group you would see only transgender women and so a lot of the male guys to involved. female or M MTF. MTF, and yes. when you say FTM, female to male. That, yeah, thank you for, for clearing well, that I up. Well, I mean, you know, it's I have to study up before I do these shows, and <laughs> <laughs> we have so the many audience a, hasn't had a chance to study up. We have so many acronyms we do. Um, <laughs> and true. different, you know, in-group terms to describe ourselves. So yeah, as a female to male transgender person or transgender man, um, I didn't see a lot of people like myself, and so started a group to help organize people like myself to make sure we were part of the transgender movement and am now many years later the executive director of the transgender law center doing advocacy to make sure that we have civil rights regardless of our gender identity throughout california well it's interesting i think people say um, it, when you are a, a lesbian or a gay man and you're kind of out finally talking to people and we always include t now mm -hmm. in our uh, in our acronym uh, and people say, well, I think the impression is, well, there aren't very many people like this. And I think the reason being that people often imagine that uh, it's at the end of a spectrum, mm -hmm. you know, that there's been uh, surgery, that there's been, uh, you know, uh, drugs, that there's been all kinds of a, a pure change. And yet what we're finding is that there's really a whole spectrum. Yeah of what you would, a person who would self-refer as transgender. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I, I think with young people, uh, we see it even more. Well, the truth is we all have a gender identity. And so at the Transgender Law Center, we, we define transgender very broadly um, with anybody whose gender identity or the way that they um, express their gender on a day-to-day -day basis is a little different than what the stereotypes are associated with our sex at birth. 
And uh, so I would actually say many people, members of the LGBT community are transgender. They may not be transsexual. They may not take hormones or have surgery to live full time as you know, what's seen as the opposite sex. Um, but many of us are at different places of that gender spectrum. I, mean, I know before I realized that I or self started self-identifying as transgender when I identified as a lesbian, I was a very masculine appearing woman and dealt with a lot of harassment, not necessarily because I was identified as being a lesbian, but because my gender was really different mm -hmm. and would oftentimes be challenged on the street whether I was a, a man or a woman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and ironically now, um, having transitioned or taken medical steps to live as I am now about 10 years ago, I rarely am confronted about my gender identity. People don't assume I'm transgender. And it makes it actually difficult sometimes to do organizing within the transgender community because many of us blend into the woodwork. We don't necessarily have a bar or many clubs to go to. It's hard to find each other, mm -hmm. um, especially at, because many of us, when we first transition, are encouraged to blend into the woodwork and to not associate with other people. Um, and so we're just now really seeing this revitalization of our community mm -hmm. with people who are willing to be out and visible proud members of the larger LGBT community um, and realize that we've got a lot more in common than we have indifference. And the revitalization, what do you think that stems from? Well, one, I think um, we realize that we are stronger together than we are different. Uh -huh. um, and the reality is that um, it, it, many of us, many gay and lesbian people, experience challenges based on their gender as well. I mean, I think of a, a case that we had at the Transgender Law Center last year where we supported a young lesbian in high school who wanted to wear a suit to graduation. Mm -hmm. And her school was not going to let her. And that wasn't just because of her sexual orientation, it was because her gender expression was a little different than what they allowed in their rules. So we had to work with the schools to make sure she was allowed to go to graduation in her suit, um, which was appropriate for her. And I think people see we've got you know, a lot of commonalities, a lot of overlapping issues. And as transgender people step up and are willing to support broader gay and lesbian rights, uh, especially given that many transgender people identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual, uh, we see that um, we really are one community. Well, it, it must be even more difficult, as everything is, when you're in school. Mm -hmm. um, because things are pretty rigidly gender defined in school, starting with bathrooms, of course, which was the, almost the very first thing that uh, we had to deal with when we passed the new law in California, where we redefined gender, expanded it a little bit, saying that in the hate crime statute, if somebody uh, c committed a crime against you because they thought you didn't look right for your gender, or didn't behave right for your gender, that was a hate crime based on gender. And that law was actually used for the first transgender hate mm -hmm. crimes case in California, although it wasn't necessarily just aimed at, you know, could be just as much a, a girl who wants to play basketball or a guy who, you know, wants to dance ballet. But all the way to, I think we were talking about the color of your robe at graduation where you have to be you know, one side or the other. What was your experience in school? Personally, I didn't go to the bathroom through all of high school. Wow. Um, I just avoided the whole situation. I knew that wasn't a safe place for me. And uh, unfortunately, that happens for a lot of LGBT students where um, the bathrooms are associated with um, violence or um, harassment. And that's one of the reasons we really believe that where we can create gender neutral bathrooms, family bathrooms where everybody's welcome, whether that's because somebody has a young children or they're transgender or need to assist somebody with a disability, it's a much more accessible and safe place uh, for people than the very gendered bathrooms that we've come to experience, especially in high school. I know I was not the only one who got used to uh, not going to the restroom in, wow. during facilities. And, you know, I've had a conversation even with a young person recently who uses one of the services in Los Angeles, and because they've experienced harassment as a transgender person, when they go to the service, they never go to the restroom. So mm -hmm. they'll go to meetings at this one facility, and then we'll have to go home before they go back to school. Um, yeah. because this is a, an experience that's pretty common for gender different people, whether or not you identify as transgender. Hmm. Well, Sathisha, let me talk to you for a minute about your experience. Uh, you're probably closer to the school experience than the three of us. Not much, but a little bit. Uh, can we tell us a little about your, sort of your life experience? Um, high school, I think it was worse for me in middle school than it was in high school. Um, I think I was a little bit more educated in high school, mm -hmm. but not by much. I mean, um, like what Mason said, it's very similar to the fact that, you know, when, when I was in high school, I really didn't use the bathroom much, but it didn't stop me from trying. <laughs> 
Um, I mean, I, I can remember trying to, um, I would get to school very early and I would go to the girls' restroom because there were no um, mirrors in the boys' restroom. Mm. So I would go and try to apply my makeup and um, a male teacher had reported me to my principal and my principal had brought me in and was just telling me I can't be in the girls' bathroom. And for me, it was just like, I had never had anything that dramatic um, being point out to, um, pointed out to me, but um, I handled it, I think I handled it very maturely. I questioned a lot of it, um, only because that's kind of how defiant I am. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's great. And he, he was just telling me that if I didn't um, comply, then I would pretty much be suspended for the rest of the semester. And he actually came up with a um, custom-made um, contract on saying that I wasn't going to go into the girls' restroom again, and I wish I could have kept a copy of that contract <laughs> to this day. It was a, it was in a small town north of San Francisco. It was um, a high school, a little past Santa Rosa, and it was just it was just totally ignorant. I can really say they were just so uh, uneducated. They were lacking any diversity. There was no African Americans, mm -hmm. but a few, a very few. Um, there was there wasn't hardly any homosexuals, if transgender. I mean, there was nothing of that sort. It was so unheard of, and it was kind of it was kind of hard because I was forced to um, be expected to know how to socialize and to coexist with everyone, even though I truly had no idea what I was, except for the gender identity I felt the most comfortable with myself in, and. I had no idea what the word transgender was. I knew I wasn't a homosexual because what my image of um, the examples of homosexuality that I had seen was males or females identifying as male or female and um, being with the same sex. Mm -hmm. And it was just really hard for me because I didn't feel that way, you know? Right. A couple of my friends would say, oh, well, he's gay, why don't you hook up with him? And it was just so different for me because this boy was extremely flamboyant and extremely colorful and I was just like that's just so fishy just an LGBT word for very <laughs> feminine and I just I'd never fought, fit into that but I stayed away from um, transgenderhood at the same time for that title because A I didn't know what transgender what that word was the closest thing to that was transvestite mm -hmm. and when I thought of transvestite I thought of Jerry Springer and it was really something I wanted to stay away from because if I didn't feel like an outcast enough it was just <laughs> it was that much worse but it got easier um, as soon as people started getting used to who I was like I was very famous in this town um, I kind of sort of used it to my benefit socially because, um, you know, I was I seemed to be at everyone's party, hosting everyone's party because I knew 90% of the people that would show up. Uh -huh. And that kind of, you know, the popularity kind of made it easier for me. At the same time, the more I seemed to be in the, um, in the public eye, it just um, was a little bit harsh. Like I would get, um, I would walk to and from school and have people like a neighbor of mine um, flick lit cigarette butts at me through his mm -hmm. truck mm -hmm. and um, I would go to the movie theaters and it was just um, no matter where I sat a friend me and my friend dared to go on a Friday night and wherever we sat we just seemed to have popcorn candy coins tossed at me I think I had like a dollar 75 by the time I left it was just <laughs> ridiculous Wow. It was so unnecessary, and at the same time, because I would have to face all of that, like all the negativity and all the um, mental and physical exhaustion, kind of, I just took it home with me. And because of all that um, anxiety that I was carrying, I kind of lashed out towards my parents. Mm -hmm. And everyone seems to assume that, you know, because I'm so far away from home or People seem to, when they think of, you know, gay or transgender or anyone in the community, they seem to think that they have problems with their parents because of it. And for me, that wasn't necessarily necessarily the case, you know. I was still really young and in high school, and my parents didn't know how to raise me, let alone a transgender. So it was kind of difficult because I would lash out to them, and it was just, I would go to school. It was never academic. It was always social. I would go to school, fight the world for, you know, being who I am, and then go home and try to call it a day and then fight my parents for a completely different battle and it was just so exhausting. It, was, it wasn't a good experience. But it, must have, I, 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 it feels very courageous, I mean, uh, especially after 
Larry King's murder, where uh, simply for being who he was, as you know, because you actually went and spoke uh, in the city of Oxnard, I think. Um, it, it, it's a danger, and I, it, I think you have to live your life no matter how dangerous it feels, because so many kids drop out of school, but you didn't drop out of school. You know, it was, um, I felt like I had to be myself, and there was a lot of things that, um, you know, I can say that I never broke down and cried and call, called it quits. And I, I was kind of a little bit um, happy with myself on that level because, you know, there's so much depression and so much anxiety that goes through this. Of anyone that transitions and then someone who's transitioning in front of people, um, I feel like, you know, it was, I couldn't drop out because I had nowhere else to go. It didn't matter if I was in school or not, you know, it just seemed to follow me wherever I went. And, you know, besides all of that, I can say, I can truly say that there were people around me who really were motivated because I was the example. And even if they weren't transgender, they were a little bit more open to themselves. Um, I was the president of the GSA at my high school that I went to. <laughs> and I, um, I had, the facilitator of the GSA had told me that she had never had such a huge outcome or um, a class with a Gay Straight Alliance um, mm. group before. And I was just so happy that, that, you know, it took me to bring people in to really mm -hmm. coexist and talk to people about, you know, what we're all going through. Well, Straight I guess people gay. would say, if Sathisha could do it. Exactly. You know, I mean, <laughs> she's going to have a lot more disapproval in many ways than I am. So, yeah. you know, I, it seems like he really led the way. It was like kind of like suffering in front of everyone. And then people <laughs> felt bad because they couldn't they couldn't help me. You know, I couldn't my parents couldn't even help me. You know, my my house would get egged like every mm -hmm. other week and my parents would just have their house painted and they'd be so upset, you know, and it's kind of sad because I know in my heart that they couldn't, they never lashed at me for it, you know, because they knew that it wasn't my fault. And at the same time, you know, who else could they be mad at? And it was just really, I, I felt so horrible. And it was just like, you know, how do you make something like that stop? Well, fortunately, we hope it's a long life and you can, you know, we all, <laughs> take took me until my 40s before I really, really, you know, came out to my parents, made up with my parents, I mean, they were very supportive all along, but, you know, hopefully these things can happen. And your mention of GSA is a great transition to talk to Carolyn about the Gay Straight Alliance uh, network. But uh, tell us a little about your story, too, because to be the founder of the GSA network, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's kind of a big step. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in this conversation, one of the things I'm thinking about is just how important gender has always been for me as a lens and how I've seen the world. Um, I, uh, my father's a mathematician, and I'm really good at math. And that was what I excelled at in school. And so he really tried to reinforce messages for me about um, kind of what the, the, the world was going to offer me these stereotypes about girls that shouldn't like math or shouldn't be good at math and that I could defy those stereotypes and that it was important for me to um, sort of understand that injustice in the world and work to overcome it. Um, he really wanted me to go into mathematics. Instead, I started, you know, an activist organization. <laughs> um, but uh, it, but he's, and he is very proud of what I do. Uh, so I, I began working with lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and questioning youth after college. and. Um, a transgender youth came out, came out to me and he was, I was the first person he had told that he was transgender. And I really helped him through um, his transition and some of the, the challenges he had with his parents um, and his school. And around that time while I was working with the support group, um, I learned about Gay Straight Alliance Clubs and I just thought they were phenomenal and it's all about the courage of young people um, to be out and to be who they are and the allies who stand alongside them and I got really inspired to create an organization that would um, engage young people in that process uh, th the power of young people to change their own schools by getting them networked together and part of a bit and creating a bigger movement for equality in the schools but what led you to do this? I mean, do you ever understand your own bent towards activism? Was there an aha moment or a, oh, I'm there too moment or, you know, I mean. You, you know, a really critical moment for me was going to the first queer youth lobby day uh, in Sacramento. 
where uh -huh. you were. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I didn't know the answer to that question. I really didn't. Um, so that was seeing, you know, I, I, I already was interested in activism. I had done activism at my, um, on my university campus. Um, I had, you know, spoken out for abortion rights, you know, was pro-choice in junior high, debating all the folks who were anti-choice. Um, so I just kind of always had a, um, an adversarial kind of spirit in me, um, and really, but, but really the core value around wanting to see things be fair and just and equal, um, which I think came from my dad teaching me these values about uh, what I could do as a girl to overcome stereotypes in the world about gender. So, um, so then I had the opportunity to go to Queer Youth Lobby Day in 1996 and uh, bring some young people with me from the support group. And uh, I was so inspired by seeing how young people's voices could make a difference in the political process. And that was the seed of the, 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 that was planted for me in terms of starting Gay Straight Alliance Network then in 98. Uh, I think it's the only reason that we got the law through in California, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth, because that grew every year. Uh, and the selection of the word Queer Youth Lobby Day was, you know, was very conscious because we didn't want to just use the words that everyone would say, okay, could we just use the nice words? Um, because the you know young people say this is our word, we're going to reclaim it, mm -hmm. and uh, and they were wonderful. Um, so what is GSA? Well, let's start sort of one step back. Mm -hmm. What do GSAs do? What are they? So GSAs are clubs of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, questioning, um, and straight ally youth working together in the schools, um, first and foremost to provide a, a safe, supportive place to go. Usually the clubs meet at their extracurricular clubs, they meet at lunchtime or after school. Uh, what we've done as an organization is help Gay Straight Alliance clubs do more than just su pr provide support and actually work to change the environment in the school so that when that group of students that's in the GSA club now, once they're gone and they graduate, that they've left the school in a better place um, that's safer for the incoming students who really need the harassment and violence that's going on in the schools to stop. So, we, so there's really three types of clubs. We always talk about um, the support clubs, uh, the social aspect, because most of what we like to do when we're in high school is socialize and have fun, but to be able to do that in a, in a place where you're not being judged about your sexual orientation or your gender identity or expression is really important. Um, and then the third type is the activist GSA. So have you found that the straight allies, I mean, I, I have spoken at a number of GSAs in high schools in LA County, mm -hmm. and it, it's sort of like great for the gay and lesbian kids. They, they feel like there's a safe place to go. And in some of them, some of the straight allies were completely caught off guard by how they would be judged once they were in this club. Because now suddenly they take on all the aspects of the marginalized group. Right. And so do you, how, how does the network sort of help to advise people in dealing with that? If, if it does. Well, you know, it is a challenge because some of the straight youth are then targeted with harassment um, by their association with the with the GSA club. Um, but it's really mm -hmm. phenomenal because there's straight allies who see this. You know, some of them are in the club because they're they're really taking a stand on the issue. Um, some of them are there because they have LGBT family members, parents, right. siblings, um, friends, obviously at, at school, who've brought them to the, to the club to be part of it. Um, and some of them are really there because they see this as a, a civil rights issue or a human rights issue. And I find that incredibly inspiring and hopeful for the larger LGBT movement, that we have this whole generation of straight youth who see this as such an important civil rights issue, they're willing to stick their neck out, um, potentially get called names or get harassed at school because of the stand that they're taking politically. Um, that's what we need, you know, in the long term to win LGBT equality. Mm -hmm. Well, it's another reason why we put in the law that if you harass somebody because of what they are or what you think they are or because they're associated with someone right. with these characteristics, it all counts because otherwise people were escaping by only harassing people who weren't gay, but who you know, were only associated with people who were gay or transgender. So do you see this picking up as a movement nationwide? Well, certainly, you know, the associate, that, that clause in the law is really important because it is about the straight youth who are the allies to the LGBT students on campus or the straight teachers who are the allies um, who are sometimes harassed by other straight colleagues. Um, 
But it's also really important for the students that have LGBT parents uh -huh. um, because they are associated with an LGBT family right. and they're facing a lot of harassment and discrimination at school because of that. So that is something that we're increasingly starting to talk about as there are more and more children with LGBT parents uh, in, their, in the school system. Well, there's a support group for kids with LGBT parents too. Right. I mean, I, <laughs> I think the greatest thing that, uh, and, and I, I hope you'll all kind of jump in and not wait for me to call on you to speak because it's not school anymore. But <laughs> um, one of the greatest things I think has been that people sort of have their silo of issue or life experience. And I think one of the uh, things that's happened with the transgender movement is that it, it, it came to people's attention just a little bit later mm -hmm. than the uh, lesbian gay movement. And the fact that the, the LG movement embraced it to some extent, although I'd like to hear how you think that was, if, or if it is, um, it sort of has a lot to teach, but also means that the transgender movement is going through some of the early stages about you know pride, about how to identify specific issues, specific needs. Um, do, do you see, I mean, anybody, but do you, do you see that this movement is getting help from the lesbian gay early movement or that there was some conflict or? Well, I, I think both. Um, yeah. In general, what's exciting to me doing transgender rights work is we're not starting from scratch in quite the same way mm -hmm. that the early gay and lesbian civil rights movement did. Um, we know about Harvey Milk. We know the power of coming out, right? And uh, it's taken some of us a while to remember that, but uh, we have a history that we can draw on. And many of the people you see active right now in the transgender civil rights movement came of age in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. Many of us were involved with ACT UP or Queer Nation. Uh, many of us learned when we perhaps identified as gay or lesbian before transition. Um, many of us have been active for a very long time. And so those lessons that the gay and lesbian movement have picked up over the last handful of decades um, are definitely um, evident in today's transgender civil rights movement. We are taking those lessons learned. And as a result, I think you see that the trajectory of transgender rights um, is escalating pretty quickly uh, because we're not starting from scratch. Now, that said, I, you know, even in the, the late or sorry, early 90s when I was working for a gay and lesbian organization, I know transgender issues were still very marginalized. Mm -hmm. And um, it, because I had not at that point personally identified as transgender, I still remember working with a transgender woman on staff and being really conflicted as to why she was there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she was a transsexual woman who dated men. Why would she be at our gay and lesbian center? Mm -hmm. And I really struggled with that on a personal level. I didn't get it. Uh, now I get it, um, but uh, I, I was good, <laughs> yeah. um, But I wasn't alone at that time. I, but I, it really speaks to me. That was not that long ago. But at the early in the early '90s, it was still very new, very much an emerging community. Um, we were still wondering whether or not you know where transgender issues stood within the larger movement. Um, at this point, I think we know. I mean, for the most part, we realize that we are all one. We're integrated parts and fabric of. of one community. We've been around since before Stonewall. Um, we continue to be more visible in the mainstream gay and lesbian community. Now that's still um, an area of contention at times. You know, and any time I think you've got an, a marginalized group fighting for rights, you know, we have a tendency just to stay in our own slice of the pie and argue over that slice as opposed to looking at the much larger pie of rights that all of us need to create together. Um, so I think it's a really exciting time to do this work and more and more uh, mainstream gay and lesbian organizations are realizing that transgender issues are really integral to their mission and are starting to change their policies and programs and practices to reflect that. I saw you nodding while he was talking too. Yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely agree. I feel like, you know, a lot of trans, like as, as an activist, I feel like, you know, I haven't just woken up and just decided to, you know, I think I'm gonna, you know, do this all by myself and stuff. I've had so much support from our community and I have done my research, you know, and it's important to really know um, the legends that have come before us to really have our own voice for, um, for it to be strong and, you know, supportive to others because it's, you can't really speak about something um, that's happened to you personally without really being aware of what's gone, what, how um, it's been affected in the past or how it will be um, changed in the future. And I kind of, um, something that I mentioned in Oxnard was that I kind of see it now as, um, 
I feel I feel personally that um, the gay community seems to be getting a little bit more um, accepted than transgenders because you know what I've noticed is that first it's you know heterosexuality and you know people who are biologically themselves you know it's all it's all normal and then it's the gays you know like oh my god it's the gays and now over the years of me being um, growing up I'm only 18 but <laughs> I I've, I've seen I've noticed that a lot of people tend to not pay attention, even youth my age, you know, don't seem to be, pay attention too much on the homosexuals, I mean on the gay um, community, than the transgenders. Because transgenders is still, like you said, like it is so different, you know, at the same time, like why would we be here, you know, if we're, if we date women, I mean if we, we date men or whatever, but there's so many different types of transgenders out there that people don't seem to pay attention to, but at the same time, that's why we get spotlighted, because we're so different. You know, like I know transgenders who have children. I know transgenders who date other transgenders. I know transgenders who, um, just so many of them, you know, <laughs> transgenders who date males, you know, and it's, we have to come to the conclusion that there is obviously the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation that a lot of people my age aren't really, aren't really, no, aren't really understanding. So I think, you know, going back to when uh, it all started and stuff, you know, it, it was, it was all, um, as a community, you know, um, that's just my Well, my I'm thinking about GSAs and it's some of the discussions that I've actually been able to sit in on because there would be a variety of young people right. in, in a GSA mm -hmm. and a lot more variety for, for, for gender expression than you would even imagine because mm -hmm. as a young person, you actually just feel something. Mm -hmm. You feel attracted to the other sex. You feel attracted to the same sex. You feel like you're not in the right body for your sex Absolutely. and anything kind of along the way. And one of the things that I saw in the group was they struggling to help each other, struggling to understand each other when they weren't the same was quite wonderful for themselves. Have you found this, Carolyn? Well, yeah, there's, you know, I think one of the things that's happening is that young people, there's a lot of fluidity mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. sexual orientation and gender identity um, and expression, which is just part of the world. That's just reality. Um, and young people are also going through that process of figuring out your identity <laughs> um, and also figuring out what to call it um, and how to express it and what to, you know, what to name it. So there is that process that's happening you know, when you're a teenager in high school. Um, that's a perfectly normal part of adolescent development. And so what's great about a GSA is that there you have a safe place to kind of explore some of that and talk with other people who might be similar to you or they might be different from you. And so you can learn from each other. Um, and that, I think that, you know, from my perspective in, in thinking about the, you know, the, the term even gay straight alliance is not a particularly inclusive term. <laughs> um, but it, it, the concept is, you know, is an inclusive concept in the way that it's actually being lived out. And the lived experience of young people in school when they're being harassed is so often about gender expression. It's really not very often that it's actually about who they're dating or who they're holding hands with. Um, sometimes it's about, you know, wanting to take a same-sex partner to a dance. And if they're not allowed to, that's an example of discrimination on the part of the school based on sexual orientation. But when someone's called a, an anti-gay name, what we often call an anti-gay name, the reason they were targeted often has to do with their gender expression. Right. They, nobody knows whether you're gay or not. Exactly. I mean, it's, right. they simply assume that you are because that's the only real box right. that they have to and put you in. But it's really about you yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And young people, I think, uh, you know, the schoolwork, that we do, the work in schools and advocacy, has never really been just gay and lesbian, and then, you know, or gay, lesbian, and bisexual, with transgender as an add-on or an afterthought, because of the nature of harassment being so much about gender expression. So GSA Networks always included transgender and gender nonconforming youth issues as, as not, you know, not a secondary kind of issue, mm -hmm. but really core and central to the work that we have to do to change schools. And I, I absolutely agree, and I, I sort of think that that's kind of what happened in, in Oxnard with um, Lawrence King. I think that, you know, it wasn't because he was gay, I think it was because of his expression. Because like you said before, there's no way you can tell. Like, there are people that you just would have no idea, so... Well, I don't think people really understand how important gender is in society, even to them. 
you know, a lot of people say to me, I don't care if I have a boy or a girl, I'm going to, you know, treat them the same. But I have to yeah. remind people, I want to remind you as well, that when a baby is born, even before a baby's born, there's only one question that everybody That's ever right. asks, and that is, what are you going to have? Do you know what you're going to have? They don't even say, do you know if you're going to have a boy or a girl? Mm -hmm. It's so basic. They just say, do you know what you're going to have? You know, nobody says, yeah, pony. You're great. They know exactly what you mean. Or a baby is born, a new human being, and the only question that anybody says to their parents is, what'd you have? Well, and we create a whole script and story around right. just the assumption well, that, oh, that's going to be very girl. Really. So this is, okay, so you're going to have a girl, so now we know she's going to go to prom and wear a dress, and she's going to do this, she's going to take ballet, and she's going to go to a certain college, and she's going to marry a boy who does like this. like song from Carousel. It, it, it is. I mean, so we, we create this make-believe world for this person who's not even born yet, m merely based on what sex their chromosomes are. Uh, it's really pretty incredible and then we um, our society just um, plays on that from you know what's the food you're gonna like to eat or the magazines you'll read the deodorant you use which aisle are you gonna shop in in the toy store that's right I mean you know it, it, it's we, we <laughs> assume so much um, just based on that and I try to say to people okay so for now it's female okay that's a start um, I mean, because, uh, and I don't think whether or not somebody's transgender, we shouldn't be determining what their goals are, what, what they're going to achieve in life based on whether they're male or female. Mm -hmm. Well, but it's the thing that I, I think I want people to understand their own language. No matter how good we think we are on an issue, our own language. I mean, you know, one of my staff gets pregnant. I want to say, do you know what you're going to have? Yeah. And I would not want to treat that boy or that girl or that boy who's going to become a girl or whatever differently and yet I don't know any other question to ask in a way to keep it's it so neutral. deeply exactly. ingrained mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. in us that it must be the most important division it, wouldn't it be neat though if somebody said what are your hopes for your child well right. a lot of people do yeah. say that as well <laughs> I mean people are watching the show right now going I'm not like that you mm. know I mean I'm saying is it healthy um, and that's and good for them yeah. if they do that and you don't want to not ask because, in a way, it is the way that we show interest to a person who's just had a child. That's you know. But I don't. I don't think I've ever asked anyone uh, what they were going to have. I always, from my experience, I've just um, usually asked what they're what they plan on naming their child. Uh -huh. So I feel like that's important. <laughs> but I think it is important. Mm -hmm. I know somebody was saying they were naming. There were a lot of young girls being or new girls, new baby girls being named Tyler. And they the wondered what their now. experience was going to be because it, if people would say, oh, that's a boy's name, or if enough girls named Tyler happen, it becomes a girl's name, you know, like Leslie, which mm -hmm. used to be a boy's mm -hmm. name, right? I, it's just so divided. And yet what you're doing really is saying you have to look at the very fundamental assumptions you make in society. I think this work is so fundamental to societal change the work that you do. And I mean, it's interesting that you're on the board of Mason's organization, that you, you make that connection, mm -hmm. you know, and that you operate in a, in a larger context mm -hmm. with people who are uh, going through other struggles. We're seeing the same thing in a way with race, not in yeah. terms of the ability really to change necessarily, but in the um, feeling that I don't want to check any one of those boxes. Mm -hmm. Because by now, I don't know. You know, I could be this and this and this. And that, I think, is also a, a, an important aspect of change. I absolutely agree. Um, a couple of, of my friends and I were discussing on, well, what do you check in the box? Or what, what, what do you look for when you look for an application and stuff? And honestly, my own personal opinion, I think that it should just be left up to the person who's filling it out. You know, um, I know transgenders, like personally, I don't, I, I absolutely um, accept the fact that I am transgender first and foremost, but at the same time, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a label, it becomes a label that people, she's not female, that's not a female, that's a transgender, you know, like all of a sudden, like I'm an alien now, you know, and it's just, I would prefer to put in my own label, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I feel like a transgender. Most of the time I feel like a woman, but does that really defy who I am? Mm -hmm. Is what's so important. And people, you know, people have so many, ver you know, even, even tra not even transgenders necessarily, even um, 
you know, a couple of people in the gay community, they have names that are just so, you know, fishy. You know, sometimes um, they feel like females um, and then the next day they feel like going back to males, you know, or expressing themselves as mm -hmm. males. Mm -hmm. So we can't, I mean, it just goes a little bit further. Like there are so many types of people in our community that it's even hard to label one as a transgender or a homosexual because there's so many varieties. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sorry, well, I was just going to say, like, we so often just thinking about forms and literally having to check off boxes where there's only two choices, male and female. And the reality is what you're saying. I totally agree. There's such a spectrum um, of, of who we are in terms Absolutely. of our, you know, our gender identity and also expression. And it's not, it, it doesn't always align into one box or the other. <laughs> Like, so, I mean, it'd be great if you could, I mean, on our forms, when we do programs and we have people fill out forms, we just have a blank, you know, fill in what you want. Exactly. <laughs> There's no other. It's just what it is. What is it Right, that and you're you... not an other either. Exactly. You know, yeah. and it's just like, well, there's a question is like, you know, the, the options that they give you, I feel is so unnecessary because if you put gender, you obviously know what gender you are. You know, whether it was biological or the gender that you tra um, do um, transition to, you know, so that's up to you. You know, the point of male and female seems so unnecessary because when you think gender or sex, what do you typically think? The gender or sex that you are. So it's just, it seems unnecessary to me. <laughs> Still, what Mason said was very interesting, and that is, you know, you're fine now. Nobody's mm -hmm. harassing you. You're a guy. That's it. Right. And so nothing about you, unless I guess they know you're transgender would be something that people would feel even, you know, slightly discomfited with. Well, I have my fey moments. Yes. So, you know, Let's I mean, I, I definitely <laughs> identify as a queer man, uh -huh. but I forget sometimes that I'm transgender, I'll be honest. Absolutely. I mean, and I identify oftentimes more with the gay male community than I do some of the transgender communities. So, I mean, many of us go through many worlds, right? We have many doors that we walk through in a, in a given day. Um, and I'm more likely to be uh, assumed to be different based on my sexual orientation and my gender now, ironically. Um, but it is true. I mean, we have people who experience discrimination for many reasons. Very few of us fit simple boxes, regardless of your gender identity or sexual orientation. And, uh, and, and I think for me, when I first started doing work, I mean, first I started off as a strong feminist um, and really um, was very active, like Carolyn, in a lot of the women's rights and reproductive rights movements. Um, and then doing gay and lesbian work and now transgender work, to me it's all linked. It's all about being who we are authentically, having pride in who we are, and for people to have the rights they need to be safe and whole people in the society. And, and that's what it's all about. I do want to um, say, um, as far as the Calo, because I know a lot of transgenders, what we are trying to do now is change our names so that it fits on our IDs, you know, and there we have it again. Are we male or female? What does our D ID classify us as when we change our names that, um, and change our sexes? And it's kind of hard because, you know, I don't want to say that um, fully, I don't want my ID to have a TG on it for sex. And so I do put female, you know, but I, I, it makes me kind of wonder how many other people are still having problems what to put on their IDs, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, like I said again, there should not just be two options. You know, I think it should just be like, however represented, you know? I mean, sometimes it's obvious. I mean, I get clocked all the time, you know, no matter what my ID says. And, you know, they'll just <laughs> be Why like, does your ID have to say your gender on it in the first place? Exactly, exactly. Well, it's the same thing with your driver's license. I mean, you have to feel sorry a little bit for the Department of Motor Vehicles, okay? Because they think they've got it down to a science. You bring in your birth certificate, that's who you are, they'll give you a driver's license. And of course, that's not the case. Okay. I mean, I changed my name when I was acting. I had to go in, and fortunately, unless you're using it to commit a crime, you can actually change your name. You can Absolutely. use other names. Right. But you wouldn't be able to, you know, check both sexes or whatever. Yeah. And I, I, if it's just a matter of you matching your picture, then there ought to be a lot more well, ways to do ID it. school ID cards, I mean, I, we know stories of lots of young people who've had their school ID card says one thing, and it says, say, a, an F on there um, next to their female given name, but then the way they appear, because um, they're living as who they are, doesn't match that at all, and then they get harassed. You know, they won't be let on the school bus because of that. I've so it's a really big, it's a really big challenge in the schools that are grappling with how do we, you know, 
understand how to change the systems in our schools. And then if you have your school IDs are in one gender and name, but then you need to go get a job in another gender and name, it creates a big challenge, especially since the Patriot Act, where the Social Security now is starting to check to make sure all of your IDs match mm -hmm. when you um, take a new job. And so we're finding a lot of transgender people, especially transgender young people, whose IDs not, may not match from you know, their birth certificate up to their passport um, are harassed in the workplace and many are losing their jobs mm -hmm. uh, because it makes them then come out as transgender in the workplace uh, with employers that may not be the most friendly. Oh good, we should sue them all. Oh, <laughs> <did> I, <say> <laughs> I know, like I've had problems going back to like the birth certificates and the IDs not matching. My California ID is gorgeous, you know, but my birth <laughs> certificate, I mean, I've had problems, uh, I've gotten harassed just crossing the border from Mexico, mm -hmm. you know, because you do have to have an ID and um, your birth certificate. So showing my ID, you know, it's all gravy. And then you show, I show my um, birth certificate and they're just like, well, who, who is this? And it's almost like you're automatically having to be to clock yourself, mm -hmm. which is kind of hard because not a lot of people are that smart, but it always does come down to the sex. Sure. So for me, I was just, you know, they were asking, well, who is this and why is this different? And I was hoping they weren't going to come over that, but, you know, people are a little mm -hmm. smarter than I assume. <laughs> And um, especially on the border with our government. <laughs> so I just, I just told them, you know, yeah, well, my name is short. What's, what's on that, uh, on my birth certificate is shorter than what's on my um, ID. I feel, I change a lot, you know, it's nicknames, it's whatever. As far as sex goes, yeah, I'm a transgender. And at the same time, it kind of helps me out because what's more American than being transgender? You know what I mean? Where it's fully accepted to be just transitioned out, you know, so. But there again, it's like people shouldn't have that problem. It's like I worked at a, here in Hollywood, I worked at a movie theater where I had to clock myself because I didn't have my, my name changed or my ID changed. So it was really hard because I um, had problems with my boss, which I ended in the end, I got fired. And it was because I was a distraction, you know, but at the same time, I couldn't justify that it was because I was transgender because there I was having to out myself. You know, mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. I ha had I been yeah. fully transitioned because she would have uh, she knew the T either way because of a couple of reasons. But I can't really, you know, I feel bad that I didn't fight as hard as I um, should have because as an activist, you know, there'll be plenty be. of fights in the future. Exactly. Yeah. And I just hope I don't have to go you, through too many. Of them but, it's well, just you may like be doing constant. it for other people, too. Absolutely. You know? I mean, it's interesting what you said about what is more American than being transgender. I love that line. It's great. And it made me think about California, mm -hmm. because California is to the country the way America is to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. It's like people go there to more fully become who they are. Exactly. That's sort of been the way for mm -hmm. decades and decades, and our parents and our grandparents and immigrants and yeah. everything. And I know a lot of people Spring. change their names. They change their names to act. You know, they change, uh, I mean, they change their names to show that there's somebody new. And uh, even coming through Ellis Island, of course, a lot of our grandparents and parents mm -hmm. didn't have any choice. They kind of shortened our names, you know, coming through. Mm -hmm. But it is sort of interesting. Do you, th this point, do you agree that this is a good place to be in a transition or in a, uh, you know, to be challenging checking the boxes? It is. Uh, we get, um, and I partly say that because we have a lot of folks who immigrate to the United States very specifically because it's going to be a safer place to be than in their country of origin. And so we do a lot of asylum cases, for example, at the Transgender Law Center. Uh -huh. uh, in fact, we just had somebody who came in from Brazil who had been horribly tortured in Brazil uh, because of her gender identity. And um, we were able to get a withholding. Uh, she was about to be deported, and in instead we'll be able to get asylum in the United States. Um, but we are getting people from across, from around the world, who are experiencing harassment, who realize that the United States, specifically California, mm -hmm. is a really good place to be. Mm -hmm. And many of us who live here in California are not originally from here. Um, we've come here because it's been a safe harbor for us as well. I kind of, um, I agree um, to a certain. Um, Degree, <laughs> but personally, my experience is like um, being in California there because there is such a variety. It is um, a comfortable place. It is a place where you can express yourself. But at the same time, because of how, like for instance, San Francisco is, I think would be. It depends to me where you are in California, mm -hmm. because like I said, I went through hell in the little town that I lived in, mm -hmm. which was only 45 minutes away from San Francisco. Right. So it doesn't. That doesn't make sense to me. Now I can go to Tijuana. To you want to Mexico and be worshipped like a goddess <laughs> and come back here and walk down Hollywood Boulevard and see all the little Beverly Hills blonde 
bimbos, you know, clock my tea and, you know, their boyfriends just scoff at me and just, you know, harass me. So it really depends mm -hmm. where you are in California. And it's different for everyone, I'm sure. Everyone has yeah. their own opportunities because what is passing, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Some people, wherever they go, they might just, you know, there might be, they may be comfortable, but does that really keep them from getting harassed or, you know, being safe to transition? Because, I don't know, this is my experience. This, I mean, our, the schools, you know, we were the first state to have protections for students in schools based on gender identity and uh, gender related appearance and behavior. So I'm thrilled because that's given us an opportunity to really try to sh change the climate um, through some of the education that gets triggered when the, when the law changes. Uh, but compared to sexual orientation, you know, most school, uh, schools now are beginning to, you know, well, the law's been on the books for eight years, um, and we're starting to see that there are some changes and administrators understand what they have to do to protect students from discrimination based on sexual orientation, but th for, they often still don't understand how to protect students based on exactly. gender identity and expression. So it really depends on where you are. In some places, some school districts are complying with the law and they understand how to make sure a transgender student or a gender non-conforming student is safe in their school and has access to a bathroom that's appropriate and they have access to a locker room facility that's appropriate for them. They, you know, are treated with, they're, they're called by the right name and, and pronoun usage that corresponds with their gender identity. But in many places, that is not happening at all. So we still have a long way to go, and I think it really, unfortunately, is, is sort of depends on whichever, literally down mm -hmm. to the school site you're in. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, you remind me when you're talking, I mean, we did a survey just in San Francisco a couple of years ago, which I would say you could argue is probably the, one of the better places mm -hmm. to be if you're a transgender person. And at that time, only 25% of transgender adults were working full time. Um, wow. The amount of workplace discrimination and under an unemployment was just I incredible. And that's at one of the, the, the friendlier cities in which to live um, around the world. So the amount of uh, harassment and discrimination that transgender people face, whether they're youth or adults, is still incredible. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like even, um, well, I'm very fortunate. I work amongst um, a lot of diverse people. There's a lot of different personalities where I work, but it's still in the CNN building. And the people who work at CNN, yeah, it's their job to report news and to work for Larry. But at the same time, there are people that work at the door, you know, that I still get. Like, you know, I know I walk in knowing exactly how my outfit or how my appearance is going to affect what they have to say or how they feel about me. Mm -hmm. Inside, I really don't give a damn. Excuse me. I really don't care because <laughs> I, I can't change how they feel. You know, sometimes I look good. Sometimes I don't. I work on the phone from 1 to 9 o'clock, you know? It's just like sometimes I go on my pajamas, you know? But of course I take the stairs because it's not really something you want to... <laughs> but anyways, the door people, like there are two people who um, stayed in the lobby or in the foyer where they greet people and sign people in. I always, I can always guarantee that they will be, have something to say when the elevator door is closed. Mm -hmm. I know. Mm -hmm. I can tell when I walk through the, straight through the doors that these people are not used to transgenders, A. B, they honestly think that, you know, there's something about me being a transgender that they, you know, feel like I think I'm better than, because I've heard them, I've eavesdropped them, on them before, and I think it's still, I think it's wrong that even today, these people who are getting paid to work in the CNN building of all places, you know, can have that sort of, you know, freedom to just express themselves like that, you know, without having any kind of, you know, because I can't turn around and, you know, I can't report them to anyone because they never said anything to me. Right. But it's so obvious. You can tell. I mean, when I, if I even feel uncomfortable, that says enough for me, you know. Right. And just, I think that we're putting a lot of uh, expectation on the schools in a, in a way because right. one of the places that we can get hold of people in a way is, Students are, you know, they're prisoners, really, mm -hmm. in the schools. Exactly. And theoretically, mm -hmm. we're hoping that we have certain kinds of education, we have certain kinds of training, we ask the school to protect the kids if they can, and, you know, that's hard enough. But I guess, in a way, we imagine there will be a new generation of people who will be those door people, who will be running, you know, the businesses that have to hire people, mm -hmm. who will be themselves different in their, you know, in their gender expression. And I think that's why we put so much on yeah. the school. Uh, you know, I got to tell you a story about, um, from last June, a, a student in Fresno, and I know that, that Mason probably knows this story too, um, 
uh, a student from Fresno uh, got nominated, her name's Cynthia Covarrubias, and she was nominated to, to be the uh, prom queen at her school. She identifies as transgender, she wears boys clothes to school, she looks masculine, she did not, she still uses female pronouns and, and the given name of Cynthia, but uh, she did not want to be the prom queen and she said I'd rather be the prom king. And uh, she had to fight her school to be able to, um, with the help of the Transgender Law Center and GSA Network and we did some advocacy and she won that right. And it created a ton of media attention mm -hmm. and then at a nearby school, another student named Crystal Vera, who's a transgender girl, said well if Cynthia can do it, even though she didn't win, I can do it. And and Crystal won as prom queen, as the first openly <laughs> transgender prom queen in the country. And the quotes from the students, other students in the, in the Fresno Bee, it really impressed me because they said, oh yeah, there's transgender people at our school, no big deal. That's awesome. That's what we can look forward to, really. And for it to ha be happening in Fresno, uh, you know, a, a conservative right, which city. which for the rest of you who aren't in California is sort of in the middle of the state and a little more conservative than much of the state. Right, and, and th I think that that is what, you know, someone called it a, a you know, a gender revolution <laughs> happening in Fresno. That's amazing. Because that's, for students to know, there's openly transgender students at my school, I know who they are, it's no big deal, they're my friend, they're in my class, you know, I respect them. And they can run for prom queen or prom king. I think it's great. The well, I think the students were, uh, were so upset at the murder of Lawrence King. Mm -hmm. We saw students from that. not only that high school and not only that school district, but students from all around the area come to memorials, have memorials in different parts right. of the state and frankly in the country. All over the country. You know, it's interesting. It calls on us to really take out our own prejudice and look at it and think about mm -hmm. it. I'm sorry, Mason, I started to interrupt. No, no, that's both please. of you. I absolutely think that it's kind of ironic how um, that fell into place because, like you said, just before that, we were at the Sabin Theater in Hollywood just talking about, you know, what we can do and what we need to be pay attention to and hearing um, a couple of my peers' experiences in schools and, like, you know, what needs to be done and then this goes and happens, you know, and it's right. kind of just like, wow, where do we go from here? But, you know, sometimes that will give you the wake up to the world exactly feeling. and I think a lot of the schools like um, the school I went to was called Windsor High School and I feel it was in Windsor California and I think overall they had training I do think they had knowledge because I, I think because it was one of the top um, it was one of the top high schools in California so I think they did have training but they didn't have the, the youth or the students mm -hmm. to put the training to use and I think because I feel like they couldn't really, they, they, they got lazy, I think. They, did, they chose not to really um, put protection uh, where it needed to be because there was just one, one, you know? There was, how can one person make a difference? Well, let me, uh, unfortunately, you won't believe this, but the whole hour has gone by. <laughs> wow. I mean, I, I just, I love it. Let me, uh, Mason, you just were about to say. The one last thing I wanted to say is I think the Lawrence King situation shows us the way that we can't separate gender identity and sexual orientation because my experience right. is gay men look at Lawrence King and they see a young gay man and transgender people look at Lawrence King and see a young transgender person. Exactly. We don't know who Lawrence was going to grow up to be. We know that regardless, Lawrence deserved to be safe and we have a responsibility to make sure that the future Lawrences are safe and that we have to create a great state where anybody can grow up free, to be free to be themselves whether regardless of their sexual orientation or gender identity. Fantastic we'll take that as your closing point. argument counsel. <laughs> Thank you so very much all three of you for being here. Thank you, Thank you all for joining us. Um, it's a new world if you don't know about it. It's the same world for you if you've been living it. Either way I have to suggest get used to it.